All right, cool. Well, uh, welcome to Streaming Software um, Management with Chocolatey. I'm Steven Boudinger, um, Support Manager for Chocolatey Software. Uh, I'm from Ohio. Uh, I've been doing IT like 20 years. It doesn't feel like that long, but it has been. Um, and I really, really like sweet tea. You've probably seen me today carrying a giant jug of it around with me. Um, and yeah, turn it over to you. Sure. Uh, I'm James Ruskin. I'm from Cambridge in England. Uh, I'm a LAPS DevOps engineer, sysadmin, PowerShell dev, now the senior solutions engineer at Chocolate Software Inc. And I am sorry, but not that sorry about it, according to this slide. Um, so today we're going to talk to you about the software management challenges uh, inherent in managing a, a vast quantity of machines, users, and the like um, across a variety of OS's applications, patches, et cetera. And as you can imagine, with more applications, more versions, more updates, and more machines, if you are trying to serve a wide amount of users in a lot of places, then the amount of things you have to worry about is going to grow essentially exponentially. Or at least if I look at my programs and features, it seems like it's going <laughs> to. Um, and it can be rough. Um, so many programs have fun, uh, <laughs> and I shouldn't use the word fun here. Um, methods for downloading, installing, and managing patches, particularly those that either lock it behind uh, various kinds of uh, d uh, registration gates or, or similar things. And as you can imagine, as you're probably aware and very, very interested in automating away those pain points the way you have to click through meaningful, meaningless installers, folk don't like doing that. And having to do it for other machines is often really annoying. Um, and of course, with Windows, there are a wide variety of installation formats, uh, everything from MSIs to EXEs um, to fonts, apparently. Um, and where do you find it? You know, if you, I think the example that we frequently use is paint.net, where the obvious uh, choice for the FQDN you'd go to to try and find that is not the one you need. So how do you find the software? How do you script a silent install? And how do you then deploy that to other stuff? So Chocolatey actually uses a universal packaging format. If you're not familiar with Chocolatey, uh, well, we'll cover some of that. But um, yeah, we, we use a universal packaging format so you can distribute this one type of file across everything you've got. And you can do it by simply uploading a, a package to a repository that you're going to own or install it from the Chocolatey community repository. But we're not going to recommend that here. Oh, it is. OK. Um, so yeah. How Chocolatey works in this case, um, you can absolutely just create a package. Um, you can do that either by uh, building it yourself, literally going into the XML and PowerShell files, and ensure and dropping whatever binaries you need into this. Uh, NewPegs uh, that we mentioned a second ago are essentially archive files, and you should be able to just treat them as such. We also offer uh, a, a GUI-based option, where you can both just click on a given installer and it will do its merry best to try and figure out the best way to install that for you, or with PowerShell, um, and, and have that actually create the package that you need. Once you've got that package, you can deploy it anywhere you've got. Uh, we support most versions of Windows. Uh, I think I said earlier today that we're treating it as 2008 R2 up in Azure, and 2012 elsewhere. Um, but you know, so that's, that's anything you want. You've got uh, any version of Windows on desktop, server, cloud, etc. Um, we even support some containers, although software support for containers, particularly when you have software that actually depends on not being headless, is a little more limited. Finally, you can deploy that with just about anything. So we're going to just demonstrate Chocolatey Central Management in a second, but we support a vast amount of configuration management tools, such as Puppet, Ansible, SCCM, and we even integrate with stuff like Intune. So you can push these packages as you want. You can then, using CCM, which again is what we're going to cover in a second, track and manage that software and those updates over time. Um, so you'll be able to see that everything in your fleet is up to date, hopefully, um, and mitigate it if it's not. So, sweet, sticky, and dreamy. 
Sweet. Awesome. So let's cover the chocolatey product suite, right? So this is pretty much everything. There's some other pieces and parts that aren't on here, um, kind of some back-end back -end features, but the vast majority of chocolatey is the CLI itself, so Choco install, upgrade, uninstall, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we do have a license extension that if you pay for chocolatey or chocolate for businesses customer, um, we give you a couple of UIs that make creating packages really, really simple. And we make uploading packages really, really simple by providing you a couple of GUI tools that you can use for that. You can also still use the command line for those things. We just bring that ease of use to the command line as well. Um, the GUIs are actually just wrappers for those command lines. You click the button and it actually invokes the same thing behind the scenes. Um, we have our agent service, which will run on your endpoint machines. Um, that is completely optional. You don't have to have an agent on your machine if you don't want to. The reason you would want the agent is to talk to that chocolatey central management thing in the bottom right hand corner. So the agent reports package information into central management. So you get that nice dashboard of saying, hey, Google Chrome's out of date on X number of machines, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can craft really complex deployments inside of central management as well that gets downloaded by the agent and executed. So if you need to push out Google Chrome to 1,000 machines, 10,000 machines, whatever your state looks like, central management can do that for you, all facilitated by that agent. If you've got other tools to do that reporting and that deployment, don't worry about having another agent on your machine. I get it. The Chocolate GUI license extension gives you some further enhancements to this chocolatey GUI tool down here on the left. So that's our answer to like Software Center if you're in an SCCM shop or Company Portal if you're dealing with Intune. Chocolate GUI is the same kind of thing. An end user can open that application up, see all the packages that you've provided to that end user and be able to install them. And again, by you leveraging the agent, you can take these guys' admin rights away. They do not need admin rights to install software using Chocolatey for Business. And the GUI extension sitting on top of that just gives you a CLI that you can configure Chocolatey GUI with. So preventing them from seeing this PC, see, preventing them from clicking the settings button, et cetera, et cetera. All that stuff is available via the Chocolatey license extension. And the Chocolatey license extension for the GUI also enables you to brand that thing. So you can have your own company logos up here in the top left-hand corner and in the splash screen when the application opens. You wanna go ahead and show. Sure. All right, so I think this is still me. So Chocolatey CLI, uh, it's been around for a while now. Uh, Rob Reynolds, who was walking around the conference earlier, but he had to take off, unfortunately. Um, he created this thing um, back in 2011, and it took us a really long time to get to version 1.0. It actually took us having Rob stop write code for us to ship version 1.0. Um, and it's been free and open source under the Apache 2 license the entire time. It's still free and open source. You can still use it at home um, if you want to. Um, the business version just gives you a lot of extra power and tools. Um, to using your organization, right? Um, but if you want to go hard mode, you absolutely could stand up your own repository, create your own packages, and leverage open source chocolatey in your orgs if you wanted to. Um, paying us to do it just gives you a lot of speed and simplicity and access to me and my team to, to help you put that stuff in, in place, right? And we are the package manager for Windows, right? We're, We've been around forever. We've been doing this for a very, very long time. We're kind of the closest thing to apt and yum that you're gonna see out there. Um, and the heart of Chocolatey is the entire thing, right? So the CLI is the glue behind everything, but the full product suite really gives you an overall solution that's gonna really speed up delivering those applications to your end users. So with Chocolatey GUI, we've kind of dove into this a little bit uh, already, but you can use a nice friendly interface for doing the same things that the command line does. Uh, at the end of the day, this thing is just a wrapper for the CLI. So when you click on an application and you click install, it runs Choco install. Same when you want to upgrade it or uninstall it. 
Um, it's got big clickable icons, right? End users like that. Um, and especially for like desktop and non-technical -te users, like I don't think anybody wants to get on the phone and talk Janet in accounting through opening a command prompt and typing a command in where she could just open an application and click a button and she gets what she needs. Um, so it's great for that self-service aspect as well. Or even switch out laser. Exactly. Um, and again, the chocolate license extension, uh, this is the thing that gives you all the really fancy fun tools that you can use as an admin to build your packages faster, um, pull things in from the community repository faster. Um, that's where package builder comes from. That's where package internaler, internalizer comes from. That's where package audit comes from. Um, all the really cool stuff is in the extension as a chocolatey for business customer. And that's also um, what we use uh, to do the Intune stuff. Uh, go ahead. Is there more? Oh, okay, you're right. Yeah, the, uh, again, the Chocolate GUI license extension, this is the newest um, licensed product that we've put out, um, and we've made it easier to do your organizational branding with it, uh, and that automated configuration, again, via that Chocolate GUI CLI. And here's all the information about the agent. I kind of like just blew through everything on the opening slide, but uh, with the agent, you can do that central management stuff. You can take the end user's admin rights away. Um, and it's, it's, again, optional. You don't have to do that stuff if you don't want to. If you've already got other tooling, you don't need the agent. I really recommend the agent, though. Uh, our stuff is really, really good. It works amazing. Um, go ahead, next slide. And this is what chocolate central management looks like in GIF form. We'll actually show it what it really looks like here in a minute. Um, but it gives you that, that reporting. So this machine has these packages on it and these three are out of date. Uh, you can generate those outdated software reports if you need to. Um, that way you can see every single machine what, what packages are out of date on those machines and then hand that off to your help desk to be like, hey, go fix these which they could log into central management, have their own set of rights to be able to create deployments and do that stuff. So separation of duties, whatever you need to do, the reporting's there. Um, deployments are awesome. You can do both uh, basic chocolatey package stuff, so install, upgrade, and uninstall packages, or you can click the advanced button and have a whole ton of fun writing your own PowerShell inside of there, and that PowerShell gets shipped down to the agent and executed. So by mixing and matching basic steps with advanced steps, you can get really, really complex with, with your deployments, where you're laying down a piece of software and then configuring the, the system to further use that software. Maybe you need to set some firewall rules or something like that. That logic could be in the package, but maybe it's not for reasons. You could still use an advanced deploy deployment to do all that work if you really needed to. Um, and again, the status of those deployments is reported back into central management so you can gather those reports as well. Um, and what I really, really like is that we ship the logs from the step on each individual computer back to central management so you can click a, a button and view the log and it's right there. You don't have to go to an end user machine, find that log on the file system, parse it, all, all that good stuff. The step collects the relevant part of the log and puts that back into the web interface for you. So if everything's green, you'll never click that button, right? But if you run into an error, it'll be really, really apparent because that's the only part we grab and ship back to the central management and, uh, web interface. Um, and you can export those as well. There's a button to export that log in case you need to like send it to a colleague and be like, dude, you broke this, what'd you do? Or raise a ticket for it, whatever you have to do. Um, central management's really, really cool. I like it a lot. All right, next. So one, uh, if you uh, want to consider Chocolatey Cly to be the glue that holds this all together and uh, Chocolatey, uh, sorry, Chocolatey Agent to be the backbone or cardboard on the back, I guess, I'm not quite sure, I think I'm mixing my metaphors here, then Chocolatey Community Repository is certainly a brilliant big part of this. Um, these figures are okay as of March 2023. We're actually up at, I think, 9,900 and something pack unique packages now. But that's a lot of different um, versions of uh, software that you can go and 
grab and use internally um, with presumably some security review because obviously though we can speak to having done some work on ensuring that you're not installing um, you know, malware specifically, we, we have virus scanned most of this stuff and we have had uh, human moderators actually review the content of the install scripts. It's always worth reviewing. But we have all of these packages and we've had just over uh, the uh, max value of an int worth of installs um, showing that you know, this, is, this is well in use. And once you're using that, you can bring it through and use something like the Chocolatey for Business environments. Uh, we have several different ways of deploying those from quick start guides and scripts to the Chocolatey for Business Azure environment, which is pictured here. Thank you. <laughs> Um, which simply takes packages from the Chocolatey community repository that you're happy with and automatically uses uh, an automation pipeline, in this case Jenkins, to uh, internalize those packages using the tools we've just talked about, package internalizer, upload them to a repository server, in this case Nexus uh, from Sonotype, and then uses Chocolatey central management to deploy those to various endpoints that you, you would like to. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a very simple thing. I actually worked on writing this um, and it is basically the Chocolatey for Business experience in a box. If you want to trial it, if you want to use it uh, on a limited scope, then this is a brilliant way to do it. Um, and it, it stands up in, in just a few minutes. And we're at demos. <laughs> As it happens, we're going to demo uh, Chocolatey for Business as your environment. Thank gosh. So Stevie, Stevie's just actually setting up on uh, the, uh, I believe, the example of a client VM here. So this is essentially what we would be seeing if you were trying to install on a user's account or machine. Uh, and we've actually set up a, both an admin and a, a, a non-privileged account so that we can demonstrate that not only does the admin account have all the abilities to install the packages that you would require, um, you can push the packages via deployments in CCM, but on top of that, the user who does not have the permission to install given software can still invoke the installation of software via Chocolatey Agent, Chocolatey GUI, etc. So they'll be able to click a button, have it installed in the background, and access the software immediately. All right. So the first thing we're going to look at is Package Builder. So I've downloaded VS Code. And with Package Builder, I'm able to right-click on this thing, and I get these nice context menus, right? Everybody likes context menus. Um, and we give you two options. You can use a GUI, which looks like this. Um, in my particular case, I don't have to hit generate, or I can just hit generate, and this will be a fully working package. Um, if I want to make modifications to this package, I can, right? So maybe I've got a 32-bit and a 64-bit version of the installer. Well, if I provide both, we'll plumb the package to detect bitness and do the right thing so it works on every system. So if it's a 32-bit system, it'll use that installer. 64-bit, it'll use that one, etc. cetera. Um, we can even tell it not to embed the binaries in the package if we don't want to. Just embed the binaries. It's do that. Give the package everything it needs. Um, where do we want to store the finished package prior to publishing it? in our repository, and then additional silent arguments. So by default, Chocolatey is going to detect whatever the default silent arguments are for the installer types that we know about. So if it's an MSI, those are going to be QN, no restart, LV, blah, 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 whatever. NO setup, NODB, NSIS, you know, slash silent, slash S, whatever those are. Um, we detect them and if you need other things, like maybe you've got a license key for a particular application, and you can supply that license key on the command line when you install it. You could come in here and say something like slash license and fill that in, and we'll add that on to the silent arguments that we detect. Or if you're feeling super, super frisky, you can click override silent arguments and give this everything and we'll just take what you give us and use those as the silent arguments. So if you do that, you got to make sure that you've got it exactly right. Because if your silent arguments aren't right and somebody installs a package, they're probably going to see the installer and have something to click on. So that's hard mode. 
if you've got it documented and maybe you've got something already created, you can just copy and paste, that's fine. Um, but that's how that works. Uh, and then additionally, we, you can include like before modify scripts for doing upgrades and uninstall scripts for doing uninstall things. Um, auto uninstaller and chocolatey for business, if you install an application, we automatically know how to uninstall it without any work. So you don't need a chocolatey uninstall script. Where those come in handy is if you've done extra things during the installation of the package, right? So maybe you've set a firewall rule or maybe set some registry keys or something like that. Auto uninstaller only knows about the software and will remove the software. It's going to leave those changes to the firewall or the registry behind. So an uninstall script is where you would do the reverse. So if you put something on in an install, you could use the uninstall to take it off. Some examples there might be removing files that you ha you know are uh, cached or something along those lines within the machine, um, which is always handy. Another thing that I absolutely love about uh, Package Builder is that it should surface, and I'm really now hoping that the software we've picked is going to surface this, uh, any arguments it can detect from the installer uh, within the install script. So, This particular installer won't because it doesn't have any. Um, but when we do 7-zip, we, we will see that. Um, the new spec information tab, this is the metadata about this particular application. Um, this becomes really, really important when you're delivering software to your end users that they're going to use the GUI to consume, um, especially if you're doing stuff with like multiple web browsers. Say you've got Firefox, Chrome, and Edge packaged, and you deliver those to the end users. You're probably going to use Internalizer for that if you're a business customer. Um, and the maintainers will have already done the hard work to make it look pretty. But the prettiness of Chocolatey GUI in terms of the details of the package comes from the new spec. We read this thing and make it look nice inside of the GUI. So if you're creating your own packages and want to be super helpful to your users in terms of this is what this software is, this is what this software does, if you have a problem with this software, don't call me, call the help desk. That sort of stuff can go inside of the new spec information tab here. Um, now, I'm not actually going to do anything because we only have a little bit of time. So I'm just going to click Generate. And what that's going to do is in the background, it's going to run that Chaco new command. And it's going to generate my package uh, for Visual Studio Code in whatever the output directory was uh, in this first table here, which is my downloads folder. So if we look, here's my Visual Studio Code or Visual Studio Code folder, which is all the stuff for the package. So here's our install script. Here's our binary. Uh, there's an ignore file so it doesn't get shimmed. We won't really get into that. But um, here's the actual finished package as well. So at this point, we could right click on this. Um, if you're using Intune, you could say convert to Intune. And it will create that Intune win file for you. And then you could publish that to Intune. Or you could right click and say upload. Um, to a repository, you'll get this box. I don't have the URL and the API key handy, and it'll take me a second to get it, so just pretend that that's all filled in, and you click Upload, and that publishes it to the repository. As soon as that happens, it's immediately available for the clients um, to be able to deploy it. So um, using Package Builder, it can be really, really quick to go from that oh crap, there's a CVE and I've got 10,000 machines affected to it's, it's packaged and ready to deploy, right? It, it doesn't take very, very long. Um, so if we look at this in a, a more interesting uh, way, and since we know that all of these UIs just wrap um, the command line for Chocolatey, we can really start to exploit um, the fact that that is the way it is. So if I could like copy this link, for example, um, I could come down here and open a PowerShell prompt. And let me go to this packages folder. And I could say Chaco new. And if I had downloaded that 7-zip MSI, I could say file and then provide it the path. So um, if I were to just play. I could say downloads and then 
Visual Studio Code like that, and then build package, right? And hopefully that's big enough for everybody. Let me make this a little bit bigger while I'm at it. I was going to say I'm glad we're getting into this because I, I said earlier that people were sick of clicking through things, and then we, we've gone for the clicky things. But it's always good to have the options. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so this is the command line that we use in that package builder GUI. And I just click the generate bucket button. It did this. That's all it did. Um, so as you can see, it's just a command line. Command lines are scriptable. So if you've got a file share of your existing installers, for example, you could do something like get child item file share include star.msi star.exe for each object chalk a new file dollar underscore full name build package and it'll just recursively look at all your installers and generate your packages in a single line of PowerShell code and then conversely to push them all you could do a get child item wherever you stored them and for each object choco push dollar underscore full name for the nupkegs and publish them. So in two lines of PowerShell code, you can start using the solution today with taking your existing installers, chocolatizing them, and publishing them to a repository. That way you can start Choco installing them everywhere else. Um, you can also use Choc Choco's uh, new command with a URL. So if you've got a download URL, for example, you could say Choco URL or Choco new URL and do the same thing. And what we do in this case is we go out to that URL and we download the binary and we bake the binary into the package. So we do the same kind of thing. We'll just download the binary and then inspect it for the silent args and, and create the package. Um, so it's really, really fast to create a chocolate package with chocolate for business. In the open source version, it's a lot more work. Uh, conversely, um, if there's something already on the community repository that you want, you can just go grab that as well. So you can say Choco download for that and then give it a package name. So in this case, we'll say Google Chrome. And then we'll give it the internalized flag. And then I'm also going to explicitly go out to us to grab it because I'm not sure if this source is actually on or off on this box. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the advantages, of course, of the internalized flag is that uh, I mentioned in a talk earlier where I was talking about the chocolate repository, the community repository, sorry, um, is that the uh, packages there are often linking out to external binaries because you don't have distribu distribution rights to be able to publicly re-upload them. Um, in this case, the internal, uh, and Google Chrome is actually a package well known for having a single URL for downloading the latest and greatest whatever else you've got. That's what you're getting when you go to that URL. So the advantage here is that's pulling the binary down and embedding it in your package so that when you install version 1.2.3, that's what you're going to install, which is nice from a you know what you've got perspective. Although obviously if you enable that auto updaters, it's going to go all the time. Yeah. You'll also notice that we grab more than just Google Chrome here. So Chocolatey has the concept of dependencies. So if a piece of software that you're installing requires like Java, you could take a dependency on that version of Java and Chocolatey will install it before it installs the actual piece of software you asked for. Um, so in the case of Google Chrome, the maintainer has taken a couple of dependencies on some helper extensions for Chocolatey that just add some PowerShell goodness into Chocolatey packaging. Um, mostly for compatibility and backwards compatibility uh, reasons. Some of this stuff is kind of baked into chocolatey at this point, but we don't, we can't ensure that everybody's on the latest version of chocolatey all the time, right? So with these dependencies, we can ensure um, that the package is always going to work. And by having the internalizer grab all the dependencies at the same time, you can ensure that the package, once it's in your repository, is going to work every single time, too. It's going to have everything it needs. Um, it's very, very handy to, to be able to grab those dependencies and have Chocolatey be dependency aware at the same time. Uh, and the same rules apply here. Uh, once you have that package internalized, you can publish it, and it's immediately available. What were we going to talk about next? Um, I need to log out of this.
this machine and log back in as a non-admin user. So rolling on to presumably the Chocolate GUI demo, um, we're going to show uh, off the ability to easily expose installation of random things to your users. Um, the one of the plus sides here is that you know maybe you have deployed Google Chrome or something similar across the enterprise as um, the choice for it, but you don't mind the idea of Firefox, and maybe you don't want to deploy that out to everybody. Um, if somebody does prefer Firefox, you can give them permissions to uh, install certain software and have them install Firefox on their own uh, merit, as it were, uh, even without granting them any access beyond what you'd want to. If we look at our chocolatey GUI application on this VM, uh, we can see that these are all the chocolatey packages currently installed on this device. And if we look at our chocolatey internal Nexus repository source, these are all the packages that are available uh, to us. So if I wanted to, uh, I could come down here and I could say Google Chrome, for example. I could either right click and say install, or go to the details page, or double click that package and it'll open the details page as well. And you can see this is where that new spec becomes important. All the stuff is there because it's filled out in the new spec file. Um, and you can either uh, just click install or install advanced. Advanced gives you the ability to have more control over that installation. So if you need to provide parameters to it, um, change settings like execution timeout, whatever the case may be, all of those settings are here. I'm actually just going to do a regular install. And what we'll see, and what we hopefully see in the console output, um, you can see this line here, start of agent. That tells me that a non-admin user has executed uh, or has actually clicked this install button, and the chocolatey agent background service is the one that's going to actually run the installer. So Bob here is just a user. He doesn't have any rights other than remote desktop user to be able to show you this. Um, he's just a standard user on this machine. Um, but he is able to install uh, whatever software uh, he needs because it's in this chocolatey uh, GUI application. And I should have picked a smaller installer because Chrome does take a second, but um, there it is. So now we have, now we have Google Chrome. Uh, the nice thing about this too uh, is once Google Chrome's installed, with some additional configuration, um, Bob can uninstall Chrome because he installed it. But if you as an admin were to push this out, he couldn't. He had to live with it. So you have a little bit of control over what actually is required to be on the box, and then they can add other stuff if they want to, but they can't take anything away that you've given them, which is super convenient. Something else that folk might have noticed uh, is that the Jogged Community Repository wasn't showing up there. Um, so obviously a suggestion for businesses uh, it would be to restrict what users can install to only sources that you trust and maintain uh, and not to uh, allow access to the Jogged Community Repository. So through that, obviously, users wouldn't be able to install arbitrary packages from there, and we set that up by default. Yep. Oh, you're good, you're good. All right, I'm going to blow this up a little bit, hopefully. Yeah, that looks good. Um, so this is our central management dash dashboard. This is that web page single pane of glass thing where you can manage all of your endpoints reporting into Chocolatey. So if we go to computers, for example, we can see that I've got two machines reporting in. I've got this client machine and I've got my actual server uh, checking in here as well. And if we look at the user machine, we can see all of the packages that are currently installed on this machine. And I've noticed that I've got an older version of the Chocolatey extension on this machine. So I could create a deployment to upgrade the Chocolatey extension if I wanted to. I'm not going to, but I could. Um, if I wanted to do a deployment, at the minute, deployments are all based on groups. So a machine has to be a member of a group, and then you target that group to do the deployment. Um, that's all scriptable via the API, so if you're like using SCCM collections or like Active Directory OUs or Active Directory groups or whatever system, you could write some PowerShell that gets the computer names 
and then does a REST call to the group's API to create that group if it needs to, and then add those machines as members of that group. Um, so it is very, very scriptable, um, relatively easy to keep that in sync with an external system if you need to. Um, for our purposes, I'm just gonna create a quick demo group, and I'm gonna slide that user machine into it, and then I'm gonna click Save. So now that I've got my group created, I can start to do a deployment. So on the deployment side, uh, we can create a new one, and then we can give it a friendly name. So we'll do something like Summit uh, 2023, and I'll turn caps lock off so I'm not shouting anymore. And then we can start adding steps. So in this one, I wanna do, uh, I think I saw 7-zip in the repository, so we'll call it 7-zip. And we'll say this is an install command and we'll give it that package name. And if I needed to like install a specific version, I could. And if it's a pre-release version, I can do that. I'm gonna assume that you've got all the same advanced uh, control over that as, as you would have on a local. It's a little bit different when, when you do it in a central management deployment, there's not as much control on the screen to do those advanced things with like package parameters, et cetera. Um, but again, um, if you needed to, we could come in here, we could add a step just so we're not conf confused and we could say like step with advanced. If you needed to do a more complex chocolatey install command line, you could come in here and do that more advanced install. So we could say Chaco install foo uh, dash dash package parameters equals and do all of our, all of our stuff here if, if we needed to do that really, really advanced stuff. Um, you're not limited, it's just different. It's not in that really simple UI. Um, but again, an advanced step is just PowerShell. You can do whatever you need to in here. So if you need to like grab a service and stop it or start a service or change a firewall rule or set a key, registry key or write a file and then add some content to that file, whatever it is, you can do it in an advanced step if you have to. Um, and we also have the concept of sensitive variables. Similar to how you can have secrets in a CI CD pipeline, you could create a sensitive variable inside of central management that has like a password or a license key or a GUID or a token or whatever it is. And then you can just reference that secret inside of your advanced step. We'll ship that down to the agent encrypted. The agent will decrypt it and use it and then it's it's never like emitted into logs or anything like that. We treat it the exact same way that something like Azure DevOps or GitHub would, um, which is super nice. Um, secrets are a relatively new uh, addition to uh, central management. And the nice thing is this step is step two of this deployment, but if I had more than one group, I could target a completely different set of machines with this particular step. So if you needed to like, update a website that had a SQL backend to it. You could mix and match your web servers with your database servers and create chocolatey packages to update the website and a chocolatey package to update the database schema and just do things in the right order to bring the site down, update the package, update the schema, turn the website back on and you're done. And, just, and you can mix, mix and match those steps together. And with central management's default settings, those steps will be executed within three minutes. And yeah, I want to undo those changes. And just to, just to show you too, um, you can see what those deployments uh, overall are going to look like, a little condensed friendly view, and then we've got an edit button here. Uh, I do want to show you that uh, if we go to the step, um, we could say save, that looks good. If we go back to uh, the overview, we could schedule this to run later if we wanted to. So we could schedule this to run like later today, or we could click a button and say, we want it to run overnight. So start it at 5 p.m., don't let it start after 8 a.m. tomorrow morning kind of thing. So you've got the concept of a maintenance window in here as well. Um, you could also set a schedule and then set a repeat period. So maybe you've got a deployment that's got a step for every third party application that you care about. So Adobe Reader, VS Code, Google Chrome, whatever it is, right? Um, 
you could add steps for each of those and schedule it to run once a week. And then with the automation on the back end that's keeping those packages up to date from the Chocolatey Community Repository and the schedule here, and then maybe some other stuff that you're doing with like Active Directory or SCCM collections, et cetera, to keep the groups updated, or even using the central management API itself to interrogate the outdated software status of the machines and say, here's a group that Google Chrome's outdated and here's all the machines, and then target your steps to those individual groups. You're, that's literally set it and forget it from now until forever. You don't have to worry about updating Google Chrome on all those machines anymore or Adobe Reader on the, all those machines anymore. Our automation and all the stuff that's running just makes it happen. And I think that's pretty much it. I don't know that we have time to see the whole thing, but I'm going to move this to ready and then start it and then we'll find out. Final thoughts, James? So the one thing, of course, here is, uh, I don't know, actually, sorry, did you adjust the uh, check-in time? I, it's still the default every three Plus minutes, enough. so. Yeah. Hopefully we just got lucky, and it will have just checked, and we just hit the three minute mark, and it'll kick it off really, really fast, we'll see. Um, the step did go active right away. Um, we'll see if the actual machine itself goes active right away. That's what you can see. So if you drill into the deployment all the way like through the steps, you can see the individual machines that are going to be affected by the step. We kind of blow apart the group so that you can see the individual status of every machine in that group. And then these are, these are all the statuses up here. So we've got, of course, success, failure, unreachable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the cool thing about this too, you don't need like a corporate network connection. This works completely over the internet. You don't need a VPN or anything like that to make this work. Um, it's just HTTPS traffic. We do require some additional uh, configuration in terms of two uh, salts that you apply. There's a service salt and a client salt that have to match both on your server and on the client machine. If either of those don't match, nothing happens. We say, I don't know who you are. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to ask you about your packages. I'm not going to send you a deployment because you're foreign to me. Um, and we do also uh, require a third party SSL certificate. So it's gotta be something trusted. Like even Let's Encrypt is fine, but it's gotta be something that's not self-signed, right? So if you've got like an internal CA that all your clients trust the, the root CA certificate, that's fine. Or like GoDaddy or Digicert or Let's Encrypt or whatever. Um, but that's all you need. You, you need an internet connection that uh, has a couple of ports open and you're done. It's, it's really, really simple. And of course that's on the server side. Uh, as this is a pull based uh, check-in, um, you're only looking at opening up ports and such on, uh, realistically speaking, on the server side and you're very unlikely to actually have to expose your hosts any more than you would otherwise, which is neat. I think we should take questions because this might take time. Yeah, sorry. I'm just going to really quickly repeat that question and answer. Uh, the question was, will it work behind a reverse proxy? And the answer was yes, don't talk to me about forward proxies. Yeah. So the question was, uh, if you try and update a group that has some machines that are fully updated and some that aren't, will it do stuff? And the answer was chocolatey side impotent, so it will check in, find a package that needs to be updated, but then it'll not do anything because it's already there. Um, do you mind if I switch to the guy behind you and then we'll yeah. come back? The question was, can central management be run on-prem in an air gap scenario? And I think the answer is yes. Yes, yes, we do it a lot. We have a lot of air gap environments that we run, yep. I see, um, so uh, in the example of Google, uh, sorry, the question was, um, if you had a package that had an RCE that came out relatively recently, uh, how quickly would the update come through to the community repository so that it could be sucked in by the jobs running in Jenkins so that it could be used by the deployments here? Um, 
the answer is for more popular software, particularly where they are packages that we have reviewed innumerable times and we have seen again and again and are from trusted places, all, for example, uh, are owned by the chocolate community. Um, they're often trusted packages in themselves, so they'll go through far faster than the things that will get bounced to human moderation. Um, so, yeah, you've got a very good chance of it going through that day, I think, just that's fair to say. So just to check the question is, are there advantages using CCM over Intune? No, using, oh, using Chocolatey over Intune. Uh, I'm, I'm personally a huge fan of how flexible Chocolatey is, um, but that's me, Stevie. Yeah, so I've worked with a lot of customers that came to us because they were super excited that we could push a Chocolatey package, convert it to Intune, and then put it into, in Intune and let Intune handle it. And they came back to us later and said, we want to use central management deployments because when an application fails in Intune, it is incredibly hard to troubleshoot because everything is based off of a GUID. I don't know where anything is. The logging is super hard, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they just had a, a tough time with, with Intune. Um, but with us, as you can see here, I just screwed up a package ID in this deployment step and I didn't have to go anywhere to figure that out and it was very, very clear in the air because it's tied to the machine that I can clearly see. Um, and again, a chocolatey package is more than just installing software. It, at the end of the day, it's just PowerShell. So if you need to copy a file to a place, PowerShell does that really, really well. You put the file in the package and say copy item. You can set firewall rules. You can do registry keys. You can get incredibly advanced. Um, we didn't even touch on like pre and post stuff because we just recently introduced hooks. So you could do a pre-install hook that does something before the software installs and then a post-install hook that does something after the software installs. Um, and that's either at a package level like an individual package hook or a hook that's for every single package. Um, I wrote a hook that if you have a tests folder in your package and have pester tests in there, the hook will run the pester tests after the software installs to validate that the package did everything it needed to. So like if your package was supposed to create some registry keys and supposed to install some software and supposed to drop some files, you could have a pester test that says, hey, does this registry key exist? Does this file exist? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all you have to do is drop a test folder with pester tests in it. And if you've got the hook installed, the pester test will execute. So you can get crazy advanced with Chocolatey if you like take and put your thinking cap on and kind of get a little adventurous or be a little nuts like me. Um, you can get really, really cool with it. So yes, Intune is good, but I'm biased and this is better. Anything else? Anything else? I think Definitely over time. Yeah, I do think we need to wrap up. Uh, if there are any other questions, please do come find us. Um, probably not by the booth now, but tonight at yeah, the I'll event. Stay in here for a minute. Yeah, I, I guess we're not going to get kicked out. Um, but otherwise, uh, thank you all very much for listening. Have great days and uh, enjoy the rest of the summit.